Well, uh, just a quick review for many of you. Um, you'll remember David is now on the run. He is being pursued by Saul and his henchmen. He has an uh, edict of death on him. So he is um, fleeing from the presence of Saul. And we will pick up now in 1 Samuel 22. We're going to begin with verse 1. 1 Samuel 22, verse 1, and we're going to go through verse 5. So David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's household heard of it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered to him, and he became captain over them. Now there were about 400 men with him. And David went from there to Mizpah of Moab, and he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and my mother come and stay with you until I know what God will do for me. Then he left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. And the prophet Gad said to David, Do not stay in the stronghold. Depart and go into the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. Mike. Thank you, Warren, and good morning, everyone. This is our 24th lesson together in the rise of David. He is a king, but he has no kingdom. In the last few lessons, just as Warren had referenced, uh, David has been on the run. And that is the providence of God for his life at this particular time. We first saw it in chapter 19 and verse 18, the familiar verb to flee, to run, to escape. We saw it again in chapter 20 and verse 1, the same verb from Samuel to Jonathan. In 21.1, we had a different verb that was used, went or come, but it is under the same nuance, the same idea. He came to Nob. And then in uh, 2110, back to our familiar verb, David fled to Gath. And so we come this morning to our text, chapter 22 and verse 1. David went from there and fled, there's our verb, to Adullam. Now, I want you to look at this clause. Departed, went from there. If you have an NIV, that's what you're reading. You don't have that in your text. But I think in all the other translations you do. It is a movement verb signifying a transition. Meaning, of course, a geographical location. But I want to suggest the subtleness of our historian writing to us. The significance of the reference to all these verbs to flee, to move. Because when we come now to the cave of Adullam, it's here. It's here for the first time in a long time. David stops. He stops at the cave of Adullam. The cave must have been near the town. The town is in the land of Judah and made of record in Joshua chapter 15 and verse 35. So now no longer running, he is at the cave. He stops. A dome is a very important place providentially in our study, the rise of David. He will write two psalms from this location, Psalm 57 and 142. The superscription to both of the psalms reference these words, in the cave. I want you to see him in your mind's eye now. This very young man, 
His entire world has been up, turned upside down on him. He's probably filthy dirty, probably hungry, maybe even thirsty, all alone. And with every sound that he hears, maybe gripping that sword of Goliath handle tighter. We don't know if he had that sword. What happened to that sword? He takes it into Gath, and we don't know any more about it. I'd love to have that sword. I'd take it to the antique road show and <laughs> blow out the audience. I'd love to hear one of their experts uh, uh, give me a historical rendition of that sword. Uh, here's uh, the way I like to think of uh, a dullum and its importance. If you're familiar with the battles of World War II, or you're a historian regarding the battles, you know that the Battle of Midway is very, very important to the Allies. The Midway Islands were located north and west of Pearl Harbor. And uh, after that battle at Pearl Harbor, the Japanese military forces, the Imperial Empire, had the United States on the run. Uh, they took over the islands, they fortified them, and they ran MacArthur out of the Philippines, and there was only an airfield and a small battery that had the American flag. It was on Midway, and so they launched an attack there. The United States knew it was coming, but they didn't know how, and they weren't exactly sure. We won that battle. It was a decisive victory, and you had to be a Christian to really appreciate it because the battle was all about the providence of God. The providence of God gave us that victory, that incredible victory. And why I like to think of Midway as a dome, and a dome is Midway, is because after that, from that point forward, we had the Japanese on the run. And although the battles would go on for some period of time, they in effect were losers from that day forward. Now, it's not that David's going to go and fight Saul from this point. That is not going to happen. If you don't remember anything about any of these lessons regarding the rise of David, please remember this. David never does anything to obtain the kingdom that he was promised for himself. David's the picture. David's the image. He is the shadow. He is the type of you and me. And we have the promises. We have them all. But the theological lesson from David is that the kingdom can't be earned. It can't be worked for. It can't be achieved by human effort. It is kingdom of divine grace alone. So, we understand the importance of this cave. Here's another significant feature of Adullam. From this point forward, after a little while, his family is going to leave Bethlehem and join him. Now he has his brothers. It's like a family militia. He is no longer alone from this point in his life. And then after the family, another wave of provision 
Verse 2, the 400. 400 men, I'm sure that number does not include women and children. But before all that, before family, before, before the 400, here's the important picture for you. He's alone. He's in prayer. Those are the two Psalms that he wrote. He is passive, not active, passive. And then they come. Why do people come? You ever thought about that? Why did they come to hear John the Baptist out in the river? Why did they come? Why do people come? I've pondered that a lot. They come when you are in the will of God and seeking Him with all your heart and you're where you're supposed to be. Then they come. Not one day, not one hour, not one of the tick, tick of the clock sooner, but they come. I want you to uh, I want you to see David as all alone in prayer and uh, and then the game comes to him. That's a phrase I often use, the game comes to him. Because as I study the scriptures, I see it over and over again. I talk to these young men that think their career has stalled out. And I say to them, let me tell you about a young man whose career has stalled out. He promoted right up the ranks in the house of Potiphar. And then in one day, it was all over. He was in prison. And you never get out of Pharaoh's prison. His career had stalled out. Never to have that job again. Never to experience those kind of promotions within the house of Potiphar ever again. And then I asked them this. Which side of the lock was that key inserted for him to get out of prison? Was that from the inside or from the outside? You see, the game came to him. How about uh, Ruth out there in that field, gleaning, uh, bent over, head down, just working in a random field. A random field. She didn't know the name of that field. And suddenly, here comes the shadow of a man over her. They come. They come because God brings them. And that's the only way you want it to be. Seek Him. Seek Him with all your heart. Thomas Watson, the Calvinist, gives us great counsel. God is most in the way when you think He's out of the way. Trust Him when you can't trace Him. Matthew Henry, lie passive in His hand, active in His service. So every day, whatever we're doing, we're about the kingdom. We're about it. You do that, and the game will come to you. Here's the description of the 400. Every man in straits, meaning hard-pressed by providence, creditor, used of money lenders. So now they owe 
bitter of spirit. That word is discontent. It's used of Hannah in chapter 1 and verse 10 of 1 Samuel. It's used of David's own troops when they were burned out of Ziglag in 1 Samuel 30 and verse 6. Now that's the lesson right there. It's staring us in the face. What did we think we needed? We thought we needed a king like all the other nations. Uh, but he didn't bring in these waves of blessing, did he? No. Now you have people hard pressed, bitter. The rank and file had bought into the system. They bought the world. They bought the lie. And here's how it's working out for you. This world, my friends, is designed to wear you out. And it will do that. But we had such high hopes for him. Saul, meaning towered above all the other men. We had such high hopes for the monarchy. Why, with that success, year after year, why, we wouldn't even need the Lord. <laughs> That's why it didn't happen. You live in the sovereign purpose of God, my friends. And His providence consumes you every day. Don't buy that. Don't buy into that. If you're a believer, failure awaits you. But they're so gifted. They're so talented. Why, when Saul appeared, we said, there's the rainmaker. I had breakfast with a guy. No, been coming to my Friday morning Bible study in Oklahoma City for three or four years. Really enjoy the time to get together with him. He left the corporate world a few years ago, and he's a very talented guy, a mathematics major. And since we met last time, he's now doubled the size of his company. He's smart as a whip, loaded with energy, winsome personality. He's just a great, great guy to be with. And as we were getting ready to leave the other day, I said to him, Michael, I want you to start a discipline every morning. When you're shaving in the mirror, I want you to say, Martin Lloyd-Jones says, say it out loud. So, I'm following Martin Lloyd-Jones. I told him, when you're looking in that mirror shaving, say it out loud. Lord, I am looking right now at the greatest single enemy to my life. Please save me from myself. Amen. See, that's not hard for a guy like me, a half-cylinder guy, but for the real talented, the real attractive, where they enter a room and doors just fly open for them. They're in daily danger spiritually. Before I became a Christian, a guy that I really wanted to model myself after. He hit all the marks, rang all the bills. And uh, when I moved back to Oklahoma City, we got together again, reacquainted. He had had success in the oil and gas business, but along the way he picked up AA, he needed treatment. 
And uh, one day in particular, we had just gotten back from lunch and he had spoken to his AA meeting. And he told them this. He had played on his talent all his life. And he told his group, don't do that anymore. Because you'll come to the point in time where your talent will run out. Later, to everyone's shock, he moved back to Midland and committed suicide. Left a note on the door, do not come in, call the police. He hung himself. We don't need rainmakers. We don't need people with great attraction in face and form. We need the Lord. Every day we need the Lord. Here's verse 2. Regarding the two waves of reinforcement, said to Delam, he became the chief over him, over them. Uh, Proverbs 18:16, the gift makes room for the man. Um, when you see that person. You do everything you can to support them, to build them up, to prosper them and be a blessing to them. Are you so competitive that, it, that they were recognized and you weren't and it gnaws on you? We're all servants of the Lord. And we're all in different places. My job is to count you every day better than myself. Now from here, we have several small movements in the passage that David makes. Our historian reports them so briefly that they could be easily overlooked. That alone should tell you there is real treasure here. The first occurs in verse 3. He went east to Mitzvah of Moab. To do this, he will have to cross the hills and the Jordan River, entering Moab. 1 Samuel 14, 47, Moab was on the list of enemies for Saul. But David gets to the king, or he gets to a high official, and the request gets to the king. It was for asylum for his elderly mother and father. Let's remember now, Ruth, considered great among the people of Israel, was David's great-great-grandmother. She was a Moabite. He took advantage of the relationships that God had given him. That's wisdom. He was concerned about providing for the well-being of his parents. I hope your parents are still alive. And if they are, the Lord Jesus said, by taking care of them, you have a very important public testimony. Do that in front of others. It's important. Now, let's not miss the the providence that's going on here. We have to sometimes lift up off the page and go 30,000 feet to see what's really happening. But look at the contrast that's going on between the house of Saul and the house of David. The house of Saul, the house of Saul is dysfunctional. 
it's breaking apart internally. Um, his daughter, Michal, she was supposed to be a, a snare to David, a trap for David. Instead, she becomes a trap for daddy. She lets David go. And Jonathan, Jonathan the Magnificent, Jonathan the Great, Jonathan the Exemplary, his dad, Jonathan, are like this. Because Jonathan recognized the king and his father didn't. All in contrast to David. Now look, his brothers have joined him. His love and care and provision for his mother and father. What a contrast. And now I want you to look at the end of verse 3. He tells the king of Moab, until I know what God will do, you can translate this two ways, either with me or for me. Those are words that reveal a man who has great talent. Oh, to have the talent of a David, but who is living every day under the providence of God. And he had all the promises. You have all the promises. Look how submissive he is. Look how tender he is to the leading of the Lord every single day of his life. Trusting God alone. while others are misfortunate victims of Saul. Now, to me, I look at this statement and I say, boy, if there ever was a Spurgeon title, a text, a sermon, you would think this would be it. Um, until I know what God will do with me or for me. But alas, I looked it up, it's not there. He missed a great text, this brilliant Spurgeon. And I, I, I think when I look at this text, oh, how wise, how incredibly wise this king of Moab was. He, he, he wasn't associated with the promises or the prophets. Now, David didn't come to him as a king, as one king to another. We belong to the same club. No. He, he knew maybe David as a military man, a military leader, a slayer of Goliath. But, uh, but he does his request you and I both have people in our lives that extended kindness to us, befriended us, and we, we all, down deep in our hearts, we wanted them to come to know the Lord and know the joy that we had. But that wasn't God's will for them. I knew men in the oil business, fingers that were bigger than sausages, and they had tempers that would roar like a lion. They were always so kind to me. They were always so generous to me. Well, here's what's important. Take time to reflect back on that and thank God for them. God put them there to be kind, to be generous, to be helpful for you. Verse 4, 
He leaves the cave and relocates his 400 to what's called the stronghold. The identity of the stronghold has puzzled the students of David for centuries. It is apparently an uncertain location. It's not in Judah. The, in, the place is unspecific. What is specific and important is that David sets up his headquarters there at this place called the Stronghold. As a younger believer, I used to think that, well, the cave is the stronghold. The stronghold is the cave. No, there are two different words. Stronghold means height. He can look out from a higher position. That's the stronghold. And it's not the cave. Current scholarship suggests that stronghold is somewhere in the craggy border region between Moab and Israel. Here's the last subtle move, verse 5. He leaves the stronghold for the forest of Hereth. And now we're introduced to a new personality. The prophet. The prophet Gad. God sends him a prophet. And we all nod and say, of course, the game comes to him can't go recruit a prophet. God sends him the prophet. God sends him the word of God. He didn't have a Romans to look up or a gospel of John. He had a prophet. And these men were called seers. Gad will be like Nathan and become one of the court prophets when David ascends the throne. What he's in effect doing is protecting David from Saul. Notice, you shall not now come to. Don't go there, go here. He, he's like a road map. Um, I don't need to say this at Believer's Chapel, do I? We don't need prophets today. We have the Word of God today. We have the complete revelation. And it's, it's complete. It doesn't need anything else for us. Anybody that says, I'm a prophet of God, you go the other way. Archaeologists, just like... Uh, just like the high place, uh, the fortification, the stronghold, the forest of Hereth, no one has a clue what that is or where it's located. Most likely because the change of names. They, archaeologists suggest it could be any one of six or seven locations, but nobody is sure. Everything has changed over the centuries. Well, let's conclude the lesson this way, this morning. I have said this in the past. I'm going to say it again. And if you hang around with me, you'll hear it again and again and again. The will of God goes through David. The will of God goes through you as well. So let's think about that as we look at our lesson. David started all alone at Adullam. And we finish with David in the forest at Hereth with 400. You started somewhere, maybe in a different city, different state, different church, but now you're here. You started alone. 
then got married. You have children. And for some, the Lord has taken your children. You had a wife. You had a husband. But now no more. You started by working there, but now you're working here. All of these changes. David from Adullam. David to Moab. David to the stronghold with 400 in the forest. David by himself. David with family. David now with an army. Isn't it interesting? The will of God is never in a straight line. I get together with people and I invariably pray, Lord, lead us in the straight way. I need to stop praying that. The will of God is never in the straight way. It's twists and turns and deep valleys breaking into high mountaintops. And it happens over time. I, I, I drive up the toll road, exit forest, and God has a little something special for me every time I do that. It's the traffic light at Nuestra. <laughs> They're a forest. No one's ever there. And it's always red. I think when the city planners put that light in place, they were thinking of me. Oh, we're going to really get him now. Because that is the longest light in the state. It occurs all these twists and turns over time. Now, why is that? Why is that? I look at this story and I, I want to say, Lord, get rid of Saul and make David king. But if he did that, David wouldn't grow to the great man he is to become. Nor would you. That's why Nuestra is now my place of prayer. <laughs> Here's what we need to know from our morning message. The losses are necessary. The tears, the trauma, they're necessary. The moves are all necessary. <clears throat> what God is taking you through right now at this time in your life is absolutely necessary. You don't like it. You want it over. But it's necessary. And for what reason? For what reason? To learn in every different providence exactly what David said to the king of Moab in verse 3. Look at it again. What God will do to me, what God will do for me. So question, what did David know now that he didn't know then? 
last lesson we had together. He said when he was captured by the Philistines, he was in terror. And he wrote about it. The petition, Psalm 56. When I'm afraid, I trust God. And he answered all of that. All of it. Psalm 34. He rescued me, he said, from all my fears. All of them. Not some of them. All of them. Imagine, he said, in Psalm 34, he said, it's like this. It's like God has set up a, a military encampment around my life. And you cannot get into that encampment without Him giving you permission. That's what David knows now that he didn't know then. The capture, the terror, the fear, they were all necessary. Every bit of it for David. And you, and me, what about us? When my wife was 13, she lost her mother to cancer. And in those early years before marriage, she would be constantly telling me over and over all the things that the Lord had taught her since her mother's death. Things that she knew now, but she didn't know then. And so, through all the providences of your life, what has He taught you? What has He taught you now that you didn't know then? Great is Thy faithfulness. O oh God, my Father, there is no turning of shadow with Thee. You don't change. You're the same. Great is Your faithfulness to me. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time of study this morning. Thank you for the leadership of this church, Believer's Chapel, that it is an oasis in the midst of a dark and decadent society, a world that is going to hell. But by Your grace, we have we have come to this place, and it's a dullum. It's a place of refuge and regathering. It's a place to write the Psalms and hear the Psalms, to pray, and to go from here on to the next providence that you have for us. All the trauma is necessary. Bless us to that end for what we know now that we didn't know then. In Jesus' name, Amen.